wasn't sure why and uh, the fellow really wanted, but after the wedding and all the ceremony, the next day he came and he brought his teenage son. And he said to his son, I want you to know why we have to connect with these brothers and these elders. He said, Dr. Jeffries came to London in 1984 to deal with Dr. Shek Antediop's legacy. And he spoke at Head Start Bookstore for a couple of hours. But then he went upstairs over Head Start, Head Start Bookstore and he spoke to us for three hours. I was sitting at his feet and I have not been the same since. And that's why I'm a Pan-African leader in London 20 years later. So you don't know what you've done, when you're doing it, and who you've impacted upon. So this seeds that we worked on today will have an enormous fruit. And we have to realize that we have to become the, the cut up pieces of Osiris. And we've cut up into 14 million pieces all around the globe. But we've got to come together. In order for us to come together and resurrect, at the center of that coming together has to be the female principle. So that's why it's more than significant for us to end the activities this weekend as we begin a new beginning in the shrine of the Black Madonna, the concept of a resurrection of African people in a spiritual relationship with each other. And so when I took my time to come to you, I was trying to reach the spirit that had reached out to me when I walked into the place here, and she was asking me about my Madonna my mother and so having looked through the little material that i had to show you because images are so important the image that i opened up the book and I, uh, this material that i had and i had this image and i wanted her to see it because she asked about my mother who's past who's an ancestor but it's this madonna that instilled in her children a sense of pan-africanism her father came up from virginia a garveyite she brought, came to Newark, New Jersey, and he came to Newark, New Jersey, and organized that community around Garvey beliefs and principles. I was raised on not Dick, Jane, and Spot, but I was raised on Garvey, W.E.B., and Booker T. And it's this Madonna child that put that in place. So this is the image of my mother in the great Karnak Temple, the greatest spiritual center of the world, with her grandchildren. And as Alumbe knows, we got to make sure that we use these images correctly and use these traditions correctly and these rituals correctly. My brother and his wife named the first oldest son of, of, of her womb, Hakim. They're not Muslim, but it sounded good. So I said, we got to add something more meaningful to that sounding good Hakim. We need to add Sekou for Sekou Touré. And so this young man came into the world stamped with the spirit of Sekou Toué, a political leader of extraordinary strength. As it would have it be, he's manifested a brilliance beyond brilliance and an extraordinary strength. As Alumbe knows, and as Brother Byron, who has left, knows, he ran against Roger Green, the head of the political black caucus in the state of New York in Brooklyn. He just took him on because he said Roger's not as correct as he should be. He's up there politically, but he's not as correct as he. I want to stand politically and bring something to the people. He, I, we didn't even, he didn't even consult us. Roger's a friend of mine. Roger stood with me when the people came after me. So what could I say? I couldn't say, no, you can't do that. If your spirit says you've got to stand up and be a sacred terre in the modern day, then that's what you've got to be. And so there is Hakeem Sekou. And then two years later, here comes another little one out of Rosie's womb. And they want to rhyme with Hakim, so they come up with Hassan. So you got Hakim and Hassan. That's very nice. I accepted it. But I said, we got to put an African connection to that Hassan. And so, of course, we came up with Kwame. Oh, Kwame and Kuma. So these kids were born stamped with what is the spirit of Kwame and Kuma the first president of Ghana, founding president, and Sekou Toure, the, uh, the fighter, the warrior uh, in Guinea. So,
This means a great deal to me. I'm working on a book right now. And of course, this Madonna, my mother, and these children, her grands, and I, and others will be in the book. This is a picture that you will see uh, soon in a couple months in the Jeffreys, uh, one of the Jeffreys works. So the concept of the Black Madonna is one of those issues that we need to, to deal with in a serious way. Now, now that Brother Smalls has gone, <laughs> see, because he would beat me up. So don't you all even show him this tape now. <laughs> now that Brother Smalls has gone, I can tell you all that I did have a chance to go up and see Jesus. <laughs> Every few years we go down to Brazil. We've been going there since the 80s. And if you get to Rio de Janeiro, you got to go up and see Jesus. Try to touch the hem of his garment and connect with the largest Jesus image in the world. Overlooking this great city, Rio, which if we analyze it from an African point of view and we use Dr. Claude Anderson's analysis when he talked about black labor, white wealth, Rio is a classic example of that. But don't take my word for it. Let's go to the videotape. Let's go to the image. There's the Jesus that I went up to see in Rio. Arms stretched out over this great city. But I knew that this white image of Jesus was not quite correct. I have never felt comfortable about it. And I've been doing my investigations over the years. 92 when we went, I tried to find out. 95 when we went, I tried to find out. And Hassan luckily went with me and his wife last year, and he filmed it. And we find that this enormous image of Jesus on this pedestal, standing on this pedestal, and in this pedestal, I saw it the last time I went, but I couldn't get in. This time it was open. This great image of Jesus is standing on the shrine of the Black Madonna, the patron saintess of Rio and Brazil. And it's hidden from us. But we got pictures. We even have a little image of the Madonna. Everywhere you look, this image of the importance of mother is real and been institutionalized, but kept away from us. So we've got to reclaim it. And a part of that reclaiming is seeing the work that needs to be done. And women do a lot of the work. There wouldn't have been a shrine of the black Madonna if the women had Now the men look good and they're black and they're red, but I know it's the women that's doing the serious work to allow the men to hold their chest up, roll back their shoulders, and take their position. Women at work, and I'm going to get into the workshop in a minute, but I want to show you this image, because the image is worth a thousand words. This is the image of the black women who have come together after the Billion Man March in 1995, and they formed Women in Support of the Million Man March. And this, I asked them, since they purchased a number of buildings in, in North New Jersey, I said, come up with a picture book that could be a fundraiser to show people what you're doing. And they really came up with something that's extraordinary. These are the women at work, and it says, from a dining room table to a multi-million dollar institution. And I'm raising this now, the importance of these women, because this is where we're going to have our conference, the ASCAC conference, International National Conference, in several weeks will be at the center that these women have just purchased in the heart of Newark, New Jersey, the Newark Cultural Center, between the museum on Washington Street, between the museum and the library. And any of you who can and have, have the money 
should join us because this will be a continuation of the work we've had this weekend. Asa is the vice president, first vice president. I'm the second vice president. Sister Nzinga uh, is the president. Wave Nobles will be coming. Oba Tachaka will be coming. A whole host of our scholars from around the country will be coming. So we can continue this process of what I describe as a moving African think tank. And we will have to see the connections of these minds moving together. When a Dr. Shelby Lewis tells you that she's going to be honored by the Black Political Science Organization. She's brought an African spirit to that organization over the last how many years, Shelby? At least 30 something years. Shelby was there when we birthed the African Heritage Studies Association in 1969 around Dr. John Henry Clark. The African Studies National Council for Black Studies will be meeting the same, the week before the meetings of Shelby's group here in Atlanta and our group here in North New Jersey. Our scholars are continuing to come together to brainstorm on how we restore our African greatness. And you need to plug into that process, a roving think tank around the African world where our best minds and our best spirits are coming together to map out a strategy on how we reclaim our world. And this is the sacred responsibility of our generations. We've got to do this. If we don't do this, there will not be a meaningful bridge to the future. Olombe is not just a, an enormous African pan-African is organizing his efforts around the Patricia Lumumba Coalition, but he's a father. How many sons, Olombe? Six sons, a beautiful mother, Madonna, for these sons. Many of them are going into science and whatnot. So they pass down this Pan-Africanism, they've been nurtured with Pan-Africanism. So he knows that his work will be continued through his sons. But no matter how great his sons are, no matter how great these young Jeffreys are, Hassan graduated, Hakim graduated at the top of NYU Law School, ahead of the Jews and the Asians. You hear what I said? But he is so African conscious and spiritual, working with one of the leading law firms in the world, where they sent him to Hong Kong and Japan when the partners couldn't go to carry out legal business. When he got his second son, he decided to take a cut of $150,000 in pay to be with the sons to raise them instead of making money. That's the consequence. And the younger one, he grew up in Brooklyn. However, he was educated at Mo House. Mo House. But luckily, he did not fall for the okie doke at Morehouse. <laughs> and hey, and hey, you know, I brought down 20 of them for one conference, Shelby. I don't know which one we had here. Uh, we had a big conference here. I brought down 20 of our young people Brother Small's sons, Professor Scobie's sons, my brother's kids, Ken Travis, my god kids. There were 22 of these kids came. And I was trying to get them to think of, of going to school in the South, to the black institution. And they walked through where that parking lot is between Morehouse and Spelman, and they was not impressed. They said, this is just a big parking lot. And I was hurt as a hurt could be. Because my roots, my father's roots are here in Georgia. So they didn't appreciate where these institutions came from. So I knew I couldn't deal with it that day. I said, tomorrow we'll meet and we'll go on a walking tour, starting by Pascal's, and then we'll walk through the community. And we went into the Woodruff Library, and I began explaining all that it took to build these institutions and what they come out of in terms of the struggle of black folk. And then since Donald, uh, Dr. Donald Stewart and, and Isabel were friends of mine, I went into the, the, the uh, president's home in uh, uh, 
spellbinding. We sat on that screen porch. And my mother was watching me work this magic and trying to tell these youngsters that you've got to go into a black institution, even if it is, doesn't look as glamorous as a white institution, to try to find your way. So wonderfully for us, Hassan came down to Morehouse. Omar came down to Morehouse. And Omar of Way Nobles was at Clark Atlanta. And my goddaughter Kenya came down to Morehouse. And James Small's kids, all three of them, graduated from Hampton. So it did work. And all of these youngsters are operating around the pan-African process. A family! It doesn't mean anything if we can come up with these documents and then circulate around. If it's not happening in the family, it doesn't mean anything if you're not building with your queen or your king and pass it down to your children and not using your family as the first group that you reach out for and to try to fortify. And so this is the process that we're talking about. Putting our economics and our politics and our culture together in a system. Hassan, the one who was trapped here in Mo House, where they hoped to make corporate giants for the corporate structure. And Hakeem graduated at the top of his class, all A's except one B. But when he went on to Duke to get his PhD, and he never talked to me or his father about it, he decided the PhD that he was going to do was the Lowndes County Freedom Party. And he's working on a book now on that. When we went to the graduation for Duke, this white man, who was one of his professors, been there for 35 years, was just running after us and taking care of us. And I couldn't understand what the hell, why was this white man doing it? But he said he's the best student he has ever had in 35 years. Now that's an exaggeration. <laughs> Shelby and I have dealt with thousands of students. We don't know which one was the best. But he was trying to say, this youngster is something. And we were glad that that occurred, because he is. But let me tell you this, no matter how great these youngsters are, no matter how great Alambe's sons are, they'll never have this past 50 or 60 years where African peoples took control of their destiny, where African peoples put in place a liberation movement, where African peoples put in place the struggle for the African mind, They'll never have that to nurture them. They've got to learn from us what that means. They'll know Malcolm X to a film done by a Mohouse man, Spike Lee, but that won't be the Malcolm that they need to know. The Malcolm they need to know is the one that personally related to a long day breath, so he could tell you the spirit of Malcolm and those people around Malcolm and transmit that to him, that he can tell you can just not name them for Kwame Nkrumah and for a Sekou Toure. They gotta go and experience what these brothers were doing. And fortunately, these youngsters at 11 and 12 went to Africa, and at 13 and 14, they went to the Nile. So it was no question of the path of greatness being laid down for them. It was put in place by our families. And that's what we have to do. So we did have the workshop on politics. And it went well. But I'm trying to say, for you, we've got to see the connection between things. And even though Dr. Shelby is brilliant, she gave us her strong presentation, Brother Small is brilliant, and gave us his strong spiritual presentation. Dr. J stands with him. But if you can't see the link between the three workshops, then you missed the boat. Then you really should have stayed home and meditated until you got it right. Any living thing to grow and develop from the minute cell of your body and the subatomic level to the cosmic understanding of the creation, every living thing and spiritual thing has to have three things connected. One is economics, which is the productive, creative capability of things. The other is politics, which is not what politicians do, it's what you do and organizing yourself, your families, your communities, your institutions, and your world. Economics and politics go together as a foundation for building anything. 
whether it's the health factor which Sister Monica keeps telling us we cannot neglect. So you've got to have an economics and politics of health. You have, in fact, I take the three things, mind, body, and spirit. You have to have an economics and politics of the mind, an economics and politics of the body, an economics and politics of the spirit. And that's where we're moving toward collectively as we bring in the information, as we mull over the information. Economics, politics, foundation, culture is the mind and the values, the cement that keeps things together. And so culture tells you what type of economics to have to service your people. And culture tells you who to do your economics with well. and your politics with. And so we have to create an African world framework in order for us to grow and develop as a global people, which we are doing. And so that's the larger picture that I see. And I see, and I'm telling you, I want to, and I have been, and I've tried to be, a bridge to our future. That's why going to Africa has always been my thing. My mother planted that seed. And when I first went as uh, overseas at 19 or 20, she said, go, get that experience. And I discovered Africa in Europe. Because I went as a black youngster from the America, and the Europeans heard me speaking French, and je parle très bien en français, presque comme le français, and they said he can't be an American, he must be from one of the French-speaking areas of Africa, and if he's in Switzerland with the elite of the world, he must not just be an ordinary uh, African from uh, the French-speaking areas, he must be the son of an African king. So I had to go through Europe as an African prince, because I had trouble explaining to him I'm just a poor boy from Northern New Jersey. <laughs> But in Africa, I discovered our great crisis and dilemma. That this leadership that had been funneled into Africa, and from Africa to Europe, was having their minds and their spirits and their bodies processed out of Africa and away from Africa. Being in Switzerland, not many black people. Every time I saw a black person that looked like a Lombe, I read, brother, brother, who are you? How are you? Where are you? A brother looking like a brother mentally. And their response every single time was, Je suis Francais. I'm French. <laughs> I got so disgusted with black folk that were dark and had a nice full nose and some lips that spread out all over their face and a nice fat behind and some tight curls. I got so disgusted with them, I said, I'm going to find me a light-skinned brother like my baby brother and, and, and bond with him. And I ran up to the, brother, how you doing? Who are you? Where are you from? Je suis Francais. <laughs> I'm French from Guadeloupe, Martinique, or the elite of, of Haiti. And it was clear to me in 1959-60 that the African mind had been taken out of itself and had been prostituted to serve Europe. And so if we want to see the dilemmas that we face in, in an African uh, leadership question, we've had a major crisis of having the African mind tampered with. Yes, sir. And we can apply that to other institutions around our globe, whether it's the University of the West Indies or whether it's Morehouse. As much as I love what you all are doing here and the walk through here and see all these institutions and see these young people, you, you, my heart is lifted up. But when I know what is happening that they don't want to put at the center of this mix, Africa, they cannot put it. And until you can put it, this complex will never be the great complex that it should be. So, and Kuma and others met in 1945, and they mapped out a plan for political, economic, and political development of Africa. And they wrapped it around a progressive agenda of African socialism and the class struggle. And so for these last 50 years, we are in what I call the 50-year turning point of history, the Great Awakening, in which we're building a bridge to our African future. We've experienced this whole process. It's alive for us. You see Shelby as a beautiful mother. Shelby, your grandmother yet? A beautiful mother. But you don't know what she has gone through and struggling with African scholars and institutions. She's a bridge to the future. 
Our brother Alida here, the mentor of Brother Melanie. Melanie, he's Dr. Atta. He's a bridge to the future. Yeah. Dr. Asa here, you had to leave, but he just wanted to show you that he's a part of the family. Yeah. He's a bridge to the future. No matter how brilliant these young people are, they don't have that experience that we were allowed to have in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And that experience fortifies us. When we talk about Malcolm, Malcolm sings to my heart. He's not an image on the screen. When we talk about strong political leadership, I can see and feel and taste the great congressman, Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Jr. When you talk about institutions and building institutions and using institutions for political and economic and cultural purposes, when I passed Abyssinia Baptist Church, I know that institution was used not just for worship, but as a political base. I know that he felt strong enough to go to the Bandung Conference to represent us with African and Asian nations because he came from that base and he was independent of the BS that goes around our institutions and our organizations and our leadership. So we need to see and feel this process. Dr. Diop, one of our great minds, said to us that the awakening for African peoples, and he's one of the greatest men, thank you brother, water would do. How can you come? I brought my own water. But 